All right, so now that Thanksgiving is over, we just have two more weeks and a final exam. We're really in the home stretch. I'm pretty much not gonna follow the schedule anymore since I have so many leftover days. And so I'm really only on 5-3. So I was gonna spend a couple of days in 5-3, a couple of days in 5-4, maybe even more, but we have plenty of time. Okay. Um, so we will have one last quiz on Friday. Um, and, and so we're aiming for the last exam to be Thursday the 10th. Okay. And section wise, I'm already on 5.3. So I'll do some of 5.3 today and some of 5.4 tomorrow. We have plenty of time to finish everything we need to. Okay. So again, let's aim for the last regular test, not on Friday, but on Thursday the 10th. Okay. So I'll leave Friday the 11th for questions and answers, review questions um, in preparation for the final exam. Okay. And again, if you say, how do I study for the final exam? Just look over uh, the previous exams. Uh, and it wouldn't be too bad an idea to start doing that now. So you already have exam one and two and uh, three and four already with you, hopefully. And then of course we have that one last test. Okay, so let's make it Friday the 11th, just a question and answer day. Now it doesn't mean I'll finish grading the exams by you know, the next day. I don't know if I could do that, but I'll have it over the weekend. Okay, and again, a reminder, our final exams on Wednesday the 16th. And please note the time is 11, 10, to 1.40 p.m., 11.21 to 1.40 p.m. for the final exam. For the final exam, you don't have to turn in any homework. Of course, there is no homework. You just prepare for it uh, by studying the previous exams, okay? And the, the fact that we don't have that much material left to cover is, um, means most days we're gonna finish early, okay, including today. So I'll lecture what I was gonna lecture in 5.3, the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus Part 1. And then um, when that's done, I'll let you ask questions. And if not, we'll be done early. And that might happen all the rest of the days, um, you know, to spread everything out, so to speak. So I think we're fine time-wise. Okay. So maybe I'm not even going to look at this schedule anymore since I have so many buffer days and so on. I'm going to kind of think in terms of this. But for now, I'm going to aim for 5-3 today, Fundamental Theorem of Calculus Part 1. And then tomorrow, Fundamental Theorem of Calculus Part 2. Maybe some of Wednesday, but that's fine. Okay, so I mean, by Friday, even if I just get up to 5-4, we, we're doing fine. Because then we would just have one last section for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday at this point. Okay. All right, so that's where we're heading. Okay, the quiz. All right, so the quiz. So hopefully it's fairly straightforward. <clears throat> so y equals natural log of x. You didn't have to graph it if you didn't want to, but here it is. Uh, you're going from one to nine, divided into four subintervals. So delta x is two. So from one to three, three to five, five to seven, seven to nine. Okay, so if I'm doing L4, I take the function value at all the left endpoints. Two times f of one plus f of three plus f of five plus f of seven. Okay. The function is natural log, so you're doing ln1 plus ln3 plus ln5 plus ln7. Okay, for a problem like this, you should give me a decimal approximation. Okay, some of you left it without it, but in this kind of a problem, you should get a decimal approximation, 9.307921. I didn't say word around, so I accepted most rounding. Right endpoints are three, five, seven, and nine. So two times f of three plus f of five plus f of seven plus f of nine, which is two times ln3 plus ln5 plus ln7 plus ln9, about 13.7. And then the midpoint rule, the midpoints were two, four, six, and eight. So two times the function value at two, four, six, and eight, two times ln two plus ln four plus ln six plus ln eight, it's about 11.9. Okay, so that's that for the quiz. Okay, I realize some of you just recently submitted the quiz, so I, I'll get to it hopefully by tomorrow, in this month or today or tomorrow, to get back to that. Okay, so now we're gonna do fundamental theorem of calculus part one. Try to knock off just about all of them in this section. Uh, oops, I shouldn't look at this. Okay, now 5.3, there's a mixture of fundamental theorem of calculus part one and fundamental theorem of calculus part two. Uh, 59, 61, and 63 are part one. So I'll be doing those. I did two and three. And then the problems up until number, um, 
17, roughly, yeah, up until 17. So I was going to aim for the ones up to 17, and then 59, 61, 63. I wasn't going to touch the in-between ones. Okay, so the ones from 19 through 57, I guess, around there, are fundamental theorem of calculus part two, and I haven't told you about that yet, but I will. Okay, so I'm going to focus on FTC part one today. All right. All right, so here we go. So reminder, fundamental theorem of calculus part one. So here's the way it looks. Okay, put it on your formula sheet if you wish. Given a continuous function, little f, okay, and define this so-called very uh, area function, I should say, area function, g of x is integral from a to x of f of t dt, then g prime of x is equal to f of x. The derivative of such a function is f of x. So how do you do it for the derivative? All you simply do is put that right there, provided it's a constant on the bottom, variable on the top. Must be constant here, variable on top. Okay. And there are variations of that theme, and I'll show you all the variations. Uh, today. I'm, I'm practically going to do, end up doing almost all the homework problems anyway. Okay. So the derivative of this function is simply take that, plug it in here. Don't actually take a derivative. Don't actually take an antiderivative. Just simply put that right there. See the way it works? Okay, so for continuous function, little f, if g of x is defined as this weird area function, integral from a to x, must have constant here, variable here, f of t dt. You can simply put that variable right in there, f of x. Okay, so here we go. Starting with problem number seven now. Okay, so again, today I'm only going to focus on seven through um, 17, and then 59 through 63. Okay. So if you have a question about any of the others, I'm, I wasn't going to take it up today. Fundamental theorem of calculus part two, I'll save that for tomorrow. Okay. All right, so number seven is pretty much the easiest type that there is. So number seven, g of x is integral from zero to x of the square root of t plus t cubed dt. Okay, this already looks like the way it's supposed to look like, <clears throat> meaning constant here, it can be any constant, variable here. Okay. Then to find the derivative of this function, you're actually finding derivative g prime, you're taking the derivative of an integral. So if you take a derivative of an integral in some sense, they kind of cancel out. So all you do is pick up the x and put it right there and right there. So g prime of x is the square root of x plus x cubed. That's it, period. Okay. Don't try to take the derivative of this. Don't try to take the antiderivative of this. Okay. We've already done it. We've taken, in some weird sense, we're taking the derivative of an integral. Okay. So there it is. See, that's it. Yeah, that's it. The derivative of this weird function is just simply take that x and replace it with t, or whatever letter happens to be here. If it was theta, you, you know, replace the theta, or if it was w, put the w there. Okay. So the derivative is like this. Provided that it's a constant at the bottom, make sure it's constant in the bottom, variable in the top. See what happens if it isn't? I'll tackle all of that. Okay, nine is the exact same situation pretty much. G of s is the integral from five to s of t minus t squared to the eighth power dt. Right. So does it fit the form of fundamental theorem of calculus part one? And I'm going to start saying FTC, so I don't have to keep saying fundamental theorem of calculus, FTC one. <clears throat> constant on the bottom, any constant, variable on the top. Okay, the bottom is five, the top is s, so that works. So the derivative of this function is just simply put the s right there and right there and you're done. So notice g prime of s is s minus s squared to the eighth power and that's it. Okay. Again, don't try to differentiate this, don't try to integrate this, just substitute and you're done. So you have to admit that's pretty easy, I think. Okay. Yes, you actually technically are taking a derivative. Okay. To take the derivative of this integral, just take that upper letter and plug it right there and right there. Okay. You say that's it? <laughs> yeah, that's it. Okay. But it gets harder, don't worry. Okay. All right, so 11 is our first complication. 
capital F of X is the integral from X to zero of radical one plus secant of T DT. So it's reversed. <clears throat> so in order to use this FTC one, has to be constant on the bottom, variable on the top. This is reverse, variable on the bottom, constant on the top. Okay, so that's where, and you can kind of see my work already there, but we're invoking this root that we had from before. Section 5.2, page 385. Okay. The integral from B to A is the opposite of the integral from A to B, we said, right? Integral from B to A, f of x dx, is the opposite of the integral from A to B of f of x dx. It's a smart definition, actually, because if you're going backwards, if you're going backwards, your delta x is negative. So it's all going to turn to negative. So to tackle this situation, all you do is flip it and put a negative. So notice the integral from x to 0 is the negative of the integral from 0 to x. And now it's perfect. Right, constant on the bottom, variable on the top. The only extra thing to watch out for that sometimes students will forget is that there's a negative. Okay, so for f prime of x, yes, you are taking a derivative, just put the negative, and then the rest do the same thing. This is a constant, don't do anything with a constant. Very strange, you might think, but it doesn't matter if that's a zero or 55 or a pi or e or a million, it doesn't matter what the constant is, as long as it's any constant and x on top. So put a negative sign, and just put the x right there to a square root of one plus secant of x, and that's it. So f prime of x is negative square root one plus secant x. All right, next complication. What if I don't just have x or a single letter like x or u or whatever, but what if it's in an expression like e to the x? Okay. That's where the chain root comes in. So this is a variation of the chain rule. Okay, so let me show you what happens. Uh, let me bring this problem back up a little bit. Okay, so look at 13, integral from one to e to the x. So right now it's just been, look at seven, zero to x, five to x, number nine, 11 x to zero, okay, or something like that. Uh, tw 12 y to 2, we know what to do with that. But for 13, what if it's an expression like 1 and e to the x? Okay, so here's how you tackle it. So we want there to just be a single letter. Okay, so I'm just going to temporarily call it u. And by the way, uh, this is not actually how you're going to do it. Okay, I have to give a little development on why it works. But then to actually do it, you might want to hang tight, so to speak. Okay, so uh, if you don't want to take notes, from here to here, you don't have to, so to speak, okay? uh, because I'll show you the shortcut in just a second. All right, so you say, I want this just to be a single letter. Okay, I'll call it a letter. Let it be u. u equals e to the x. Then h of x is the integral from one of u of ln t dt. And that's the way we like it. We like just a single letter. <clears throat> okay. Ultimately though, we're finding h prime of x, which is dh dx. So what is dh dx? Well, by the chain rule, I can say it's dh du times du dx. And said this before, in this variation of the chain rule, the so-called Leibniz notation, it kind of looks like the du's cancel out, right? dh dx, dh du, du dx, and the du's would cancel out. You have dh dx. Okay. So dh du, well, that's just like before because and all the previous problems we did, it was just a single letter, right? So in this case, I'm just going to put L and U, right? So DH DU is L and U, and then times DU DX. So what's the derivative of U with respect to X? We take a look at what over here, or we can write it as L and U times U prime of X. Okay. Now, what is U? U is E to the X. So L and E to the X times u prime of x. Okay. So what's the derivative of e to the x? e to the x. Okay. And you notice I have ln e to the x. What's ln e to the x? x. Okay. So final answer is x e to the x. Okay. Yes, I realize some of you might be saying, my head is spinning. I have absolutely no idea what you just did. Okay. And that's fine. I'm just going to 
bottom line for you. Some of you maybe got that, but we're doing a variation of the changes. Okay, if I temporarily call this a letter like u, u equals e to the x, okay, then ultimately I'm trying to find dy dx, or in this case, dh dx, I'll do dh du, du dx. So just like before, I would plug that right in there, right? So l and u. And then I take the derivative of u with respect to x, e to the x. Okay, so the final answer comes up to be x times e to the x. But now, what do I do as a shortcut? Okay, so let's look at what I did. I did ln of e to the x times the derivative of e to the x. Okay. So that e to the x goes right there, just like before. And then by the chain rule, it's times the derivative of e to the x, which is e to the x. Okay, so one more time. Just like before, as long as you have constant here, variable expression here, put that variable expression right there. So it says ln e to the x, and then times the derivative of that e to the x. Okay. And of course, ln e to the x, ln and e cancel out. So x times the derivative of e to the x is itself. So x e to the x is the final answer. <clears throat> okay, so again, bottom line, what do I do? What do I need to do for homework, quiz, test? <clears throat> In this case, as long as you have constant here, variable there. That thing goes right there, ln e to the x, and then times the derivative of e to the x. Okay, so that's the new thing. Okay, and I'll show you more examples of that. Okay, so 15. You're going to go from 1 to 3x plus 2 of t over 1 plus t cubed. Right? So this is the chain rule. First, let's check constant variable correct. Okay, so we're supposed to have constant on the bottom, variable on the top. Constant is on the bottom, variable is on the top. Okay, so take that 3x plus 2, replace it right here for t, replace it right here for t, and then it's going to be times the derivative of 3x plus 2, which is 3. Okay, so here we go. Notice what happens. So right here, where it says t, replace it with 3x plus 2. Right here, where it says t, go 1 plus 3x plus 2 cubed. Okay. So right here is just a replacement. Change that t to parentheses 3x plus 2. Change that t to parentheses 3x plus 2. And then times the derivative of 3x plus 2, which is just 3. And there's my final answer. Optionally, you can multiply out the three. I would say you don't have to. And definitely don't cube that. Nobody treats like cubing that, so don't worry about that. Okay, so there we go for that. All right, 17, uh, similar theme. <clears throat> Find the derivative of y equals integral from radical x to pi over 4, theta, tangent theta, d theta. Okay.